welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the first webinar session in the Change for Climate Lunchbox series. Today marks the first of eight sessions offered between now and June 10. Today's session is meant to provide you with a good grounding in the science of climate change and related projections for Edmonton. My name is Heather Wheeliker, and I'm here with my colleague, Karen Young. Both of us work in the economic and environmental sustainability branch with the city. We're joined today by two other colleagues from our same unit, Chandra Tamaris and Danielle Koliak, who will be delivering the content of today's session, and Chandra will help with responding to questions. Just a note for you that this session will be recorded, and we're only recording the speaking and presentation slides. At this time, I wish to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory. We do this to create awareness and to remind ourselves that we are all treaty members no matter where we are from or what language we speak. As long as we are on this land, we are treaty members. I did not grow up on Treaty 6 territory, but I have a strong sense of belonging because of the inclusive and respectful environment created here. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Danielle Koliak is a project manager who works tirelessly on cl uh, climate adaptation. She worked very hard to secure scientifically researched Edmonton specific information that helps us all to consider what Edmonton's climate will be in the future and what we can do now to adapt to our changing and future climate. Danielle's expertise has also been invaluable for updating Edmonton's energy transition strategy. Here to share her expertise on Edmonton's changing climate is my colleague, Danielle Koliak. But thank you, Heather, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. So as mentioned, I am here to talk about climate change in Edmonton. So I'll just get right into it. So there are two approaches that we take on climate change. The first is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that we are emitting, and that is, of course, climate mitigation. And the second is to adapt to the impacts of a changing climate. So Edmonton is committed to acting on both responses. The energy transition strategy represents Edmonton's approach to mitigation and is currently being updated to accelerate and align actions that will put Edmonton on a path to doing our part to limit average global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. And climate resilient Edmonton adaptation strategy and action plan is our approach to adapting to the impacts of a changing climate. So while my talk today does focus on, you know, climate change, associated impacts, and actions we can take to adapt, several of the other webinars in this series will focus more specifically on mitigation actions, although I will touch briefly on some of those towards the end as well. So let's just jump right into the Climate Change 101 talk. I want to go over some essential concepts of climate science talk about historically observed climate trends in Edmonton, and then I'll talk about the climate change modeling we've done in our future climate projections. So first, I just wanna make sure the distinction between weather and climate is clear for everyone, as it is easy to misinterpret these two phenomena and use the terms interchangeably. Weather really represents the local day-to-day short-term variation in atmospheric conditions. It is what is happening outside now. Climate, on the other hand, is an average of those weather conditions over the long term, and typically climate norms are defined over a 30-year period. Another concept to keep in mind is that of variability in climate change. So this image here shows the temperature difference compared to a climate baseline average of 1961 to 1990. The darker red on this image represents hotter temperatures than that of the baseline average, and the blue represents colder. And the star on the image is you know, approximately where Edmonton, Edmonton is located. As you can see in January, 2014, we were on the warmer side of the baseline average. And in February of 2018, we were colder. So all this is trying to say is that climate change is not happening evenly around the world. There are places that are warming at an accelerated rate than others and faster than the global average. And of course, because it is not uniform, places won't always be warming at the same rate on that day-to-day -day basis there will still be colder and warmer than average days. The other concept I wanted to touch on briefly is around natural variability. And of course, we know that there is a lot of natural variability in our climate system, and it can often be hard to identify that climate signal out of the natural variability of our weather patterns. 
But what climate change looks at is that long-term trend instead of the natural variability. And that's really identified through statistical analysis. So what trends have been observed in Edmonton's historical climate record already? I am just going to talk about temperature and precipitation since those are the main climate variables recorded in our historical weather station data. You can see from this graph here that Edmonton has already observed a warming trend over the past 100 years, warming at a rate of about 1.7 degrees Celsius per century. And again, this is taken directly from Environment Canada recorded weather data. But interestingly, the red line on this graph shows the trend over the past 50 years. And you can see that rate of change has dr drastically increased, almost doubling in the last 50 years so that we see warming at a rate of three and a half degrees Celsius per century when we look at the trend line over those, that 50 year period. So we can kind of see that that rate of change has already been accelerating in Edmonton. We can look at temperature seasonally. So summer has warmed at essentially the same rate as annual average temperature when we look at it over the past 100 years, about one and a half degrees Celsius per century. But you can see warming in the winter is happening at a much faster rate, that of about three degrees Celsius per century. So essentially double that of the annual average temperature. And it's not shown on this graph, but over the past 50 years, the winter warming trend line is at about six degrees Celsius per century. So that is a big change to our weather winter temperature averages. And with climate change, one of the concerning factors is the rate of change. So for example, if it changes too quickly, it could be more challenging or in some cases, even impossible to adapt to those changes in the time frame that they are happening in. Historical precipitation trends that we looked at um, are not significant. And also precipitation hasn't changed um, as much as temperature. But bear in mind that precipitation is um, a lot trickier to analyze and then to model, due in part to the fact that precipitation can be a very localized event in our part of the world, and so it could completely miss the weather station. And what we are looking at here is weather station data. So as we have just seen, there is already evidence of climate change already observed in our region. So what can we expect into the future? Before I talk about model changes, I do want to introduce some climate modeling concepts, and one of these is around uncertainty. So one of the tricky things about climate change science is the uncertainty. There is uncertainty in a lot of the assumptions made behind greenhouse gas emissions trajectories into the future, and then the climate response to those trajectories is modeled, and of course all models are uncertain and not predictive. So that is why scenarios are used in climate science and research. We model different scenarios to help us deal and plan with that uncertainty in mind. So this slide here represents some of those um, greenhouse gas emissions scenarios that we apply climate models against. And these are called representative concentration pathways or RCPs. And just really quickly, I wanna go over a couple of them. So RCP 8.5 is a high global emission scenario. It assumes kind of a business as usual scenario and it would likely result in about a four degree Celsius average global warming. RCP 4.5 is a lower emission scenario that assumes action, no global action has been taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You can see from this graph that somewhere in between RCP 2.6 and 4.5 is where the Paris commitment would be and that is to limit average global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So for our adaptation strategy, we modeled both RCP 8.5 and 4.5, but the results I am going to show today are the RCP 8.5 results. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that at the time of our planning, it was a RCP 8.5 seemed to be the more likely emission scenario. But more importantly than that, our planning horizon looked out 50 years and the climate model results for both RCPs are very similar for that 50 year horizon and then they start to really diverge from each other. So what are climate models? Really just super quickly, climate models use mathematical equations to characterize Earth system processes. Um, multiple climate models are used to help with that uncertainty that we talked about. And not all climate indices or weather events can be modeled. So in addition to climate modeling, we also relied on other climate science, academic research and literature. So for our work, we looked at a variety of different climate indices. So things like our annual, annual average and seasonal changes. We looked at things such as cold nights, 
tropical nights, extreme heat events, um, cooling degree days, drought and disease, those types of, of things. I don't have time to get into all of the model results today. I will just start with the general temperature and precipitation trends and then talk about how some of the indices we modeled are indicating these different climate scenarios. Before I get into our specific model projections, I wanna point out that on average, Canada is warming at a faster rate than the global average, almost twice as fast. And the recent report published by Canadian scientists on Canada's changing climate suggests that the prairies region is warming faster than other regions in Canada, with the exception of the northern regions. So I just think that's an important factor to keep in mind, especially as mentioned, one of the big concerns around climate change is that rate of change, just how fast conditions are changing. So let's look at what we've modeled for Edmonton and what we can expect to see into the future. Again, going over some of the basic climate indices we, that we looked at, and this is a, a high level um, introduction, so I'm not getting into all of the detail at this time. So our annual average temperature in a baseline year of 1961 to 1990 has been about two degrees Celsius. We model that we're expecting it to increase to about five and a half degrees Celsius by the 2050s and to eight degrees Celsius by the 2080s. One thing I want to point out is because climate norms are a 30 year average, 2050s is actually defined in climate science as 2041 to 2070, and the 2080s are 2071 to 2100. So 2050s is actually a lot sooner than it sounds. Um, but what does that mean for us? Because for me anyways, an average annual temperature is a bit tricky to contextualize. So I just want to show you this. So this bell curve represents the baseline distribution of temperatures in Edmonton. And as we warm to a new average, you can see that distribution shifting. The new normal average is actually what was historically the warmest 2% of years in our baseline. And then, oh, whoops, sorry. Um, in addition, you can see on the far right end of the bell curve that in the future, we will see temperature extremes that we have never seen before historically. So this change in annual average temperature is actually quite a big change for us. I want to talk about Edmonton's average annual precipitation. You can see that on average, it is expected to increase a little bit from the baseline, but what is more interesting, I think, are the precipitation patterns that we are expecting to see change. So we're expecting to see more of that precipitation falling as extreme rainfall events. In addition, we're expecting to see more precipitation occurring in the spring and fall relative to what is falling in the summer. And lastly, even if precipitation is increasing slightly, the overall trend is to shift towards a drier climate with increased drought potential and severity, as the increase in temperature will increase evapotranspiration and precipitation isn't increasing enough or happening at the right time necessarily to offset that, resulting in overall drier conditions for us. So these average conditions of warming and drying are hard to contextualize on a daily basis, but one of the impacts I want to point out about these trends is a long-term potential shift in our ecosystems. Research done by scientists with the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute suggests that our region could gradually and is likely to gradually shift from a parkland boreal transition zone into more of a mixed grassland ecosystem. So those are the climate averages. And of course, uh, extremes are also important for climate change adaptation. And the probably more tangible impact of climate change is related to what we call sudden onset events or climate shocks. Um, these, extreme are, these are extreme weather events that we already experience, but are expected to get more frequent and severe in the future with the increase of energy in the atmosphere. So what does this mean in terms of overall climate change for us? Temperatures are expected to increase overall including the occurrence of temperature highs we have rarely, if ever, experienced in the past. But we should still expect cold days, just in general, fewer cold days and not as cold as we are used to. So these increases are leading to warmer seasons in general. As mentioned, precipitation patterns are likely to change. We expect to see more precipitation falling as extreme rainfall events that contribute to urban flooding. We're expecting overall warmer, drier summers, um, warmer, wetter winters. So some of the things that we expect to see increase as far as our weather extremes are things like lightning, wind gusts and wind events, 
an increased potential for wildfires, extreme heat, things like increased freezing rain or rain on snow on um, those types of extremes. And lastly, this overall long-term ecological shift. So the image on this slide is an artistic rendering of what that could look like in our river valley because it actually could be quite a transformational change for us. So the left hand image is a rendering of the river valley today and the right hand is what it could look like if it were to transition to this more of this grasslands ecosystem. So what do these climate changes really mean? And you know, how do we look at and assess the potential impacts and risks of these model changes? And that's what I want to just go over, go over now. So this slide here points out that climate change dominates global risk perceptions. And in the global risks report represents some of the highest ranked risks. As well, you can think of climate change as a risk multiplier, essentially compounding and making other existing risks worse. So we can think of impacts and the consequences of these risks in several different ways. There can be direct damages from climate or weather events. So things like hail damage to buildings or infrastructure, direct flooding damage to a building or a, you know, an inventory of a, of a business, that type of thing. There can be indirect service losses. So if a tree is blown over in a windstorm and it takes out a power or telecommunications line and you lose power or something, that, that's another impact. Or you can think of it in terms of direct service losses. So for example, if a business has to close due to flooding. So these impacts can have various risk considerations depending on what you know, asset or service or thing you're looking at and what climate event you're looking at. And there are a lot of different ways to look at risks from impacts, but I am going to go through different categories of impacts that we looked at when we did our climate change vulnerability and risk assessment and give examples of these risks and impact considerations. Um, I won't be able to cover all scenarios, but this is really more of a primer of things that we need to think about when we're thinking about what climate change means for us and how do we prepare and adapt for it. So I'll start with those economic impacts. The graph on this slide represents insured losses from catastrophic events in Canada. And um, this, the trend line for this is going up with the Southern Alberta floods in 2013 and the 2016 Fort McMurray wildfire being two of the largest events from an insured losses perspective. This graph was made prior to last year and I have heard that Calgary's hailstorm in 2020 may actually exceed the Southern Alberta floods insured losses. I'm not sure if that's that's verified or not, but I've heard that it, it's right up there. So that's another event that would be added in. Um, and keep in mind that this graph just shows insured losses and does not represent the true economic cost, which is actually much higher. So not only are there insurance impacts to people in terms of increasing costs potentially, or even in some cases, the inability to purchase insurance, but there are also other financial and economic costs of climate change. A high level study of economic impacts of climate change for Edmonton indicates that social and GDP costs increase for every degree of overall warming. So there are these real economic impacts to these climate risks. Another area of impacts that we need to think about is the climate change impact on infrastructure. So not all of these photos are necessarily from Edmonton, but they just show, give an example of the things that we need to think about. So as an example, you know, flooding can damage buildings as we talked about, transportation or other infrastructure. Extreme heat can damage bridge joints or rail lines. Severe enough drought conditions can cause cracks to underground infrastructure and building foundations even. Uh, we know wind or hail can directly impact buildings or other infrastructure. So there are several more examples of impacts that I'm not talking about here, but this is just to showcase if kind of what kind of things that we need to look at when determining the level of risk and impact from climate change. Climate change can have impacts on our health as well, um, not just physical, but also our mental health. So extreme heat can cause increases in heat related illnesses, including death and you know, in places that haven't historically had extreme heat events, we might not be very prepared for that yet. Um, increases in wildfire, even if they aren't happening in Alberta, but they could be in BC and Washington and in the Yukon, et cetera, those events can still bring smoke into our city and that can severely reduce our air quality, which as we know, can have really bad health impacts. An increase in flooding can have several impacts, one of which is physical health, 
but also negative mental health as well. I'm um, just due to, you know, increased stress of these events, that type of thing. And especially if, you know, the same event or multiple events are happening to the same person. And then of course, with an increase in the frequency of extreme weather events, we all need to factor in what that might mean for us in terms of emergency preparedness and response. So of course there are other health impacts I'm not showcasing here. So for example, I know an increase in vector borne diseases if pests expand their ranges and those sorts of things. So we talked about economic infrastructure and health impacts of climate risk. Lastly, I wanna talk about um, some of the impacts that climate change can have on our biophysical natural environment. So an increase in disturbances such as fires is expected in both forested and grassland areas. But when occurring in forest areas under a hotter and drier climate, the likelihood that trees and forests will be reestablished post fire is smaller, and it's more likely that grasslands will establish instead. There will likely be an increase in our in invasive species story. So the top right photo shows a stand of mountain pine beetle infested trees. And if winters keep warming, it's likely that species like these will have higher survival rates and be able to spread further. There could be an impact on the headwaters of the North Saskatchewan River if there is smaller snowpacks in the mountains with melting glaciers or even rain occurring at a different time of the year than we are used to. It could ultimately mean an impact on our only source of drinking water. And of course, increased frequency and severity of droughts can have many impacts, including on our forests, um, but also on our agricultural resources and even our gardens. So even though we might have a longer growing season, for example, if we are having severe drought conditions that will offset that. So, and really just in short and in summary, there are several impacts that we have to consider when thinking about climate change and risk and how to adapt to that risk and even you know, why we, we need to adapt to that risk. So what can we do about these potential risks and impacts as citizens? And also what is the city of Edmonton doing to address these? So we do have a strategy and action plan, which you can find on our website. And the link to that is on the slide. We have actions identified to increase our resilience to those different groupings of climate change projections and impacts I just talked about, as well as actions that relate to really a foundational lens of making science and evidence-based decisions. A lot of our implementation approach to adaptation is not necessarily to have standalone climate policies, regulations, processes, but where appropriate and feasible to really integrate climate adaptation into existing city policies and processes. And we call this mainstreaming. This work is very internal to city of Edmonton. And so it's not very visible, but it is critical for planning, designing and building adapted communities. I've listed on this slide some of the mainstreaming work that we have done or is currently in progress. And some of those big things around urban development and planning um, include integrating climate change adaptation policy intentions into city plan, which is our newly updated municipal development plan and transportation master plan. We are working with our zoning bylaw renewal team on how climate change adaptation features could possibly be integrated there. And there was a climate resilient discussion paper that was done as part of that, that process. We are working with our asset management group to conduct further detailed risk and vulnerability assessments through a process called PIVC, which just stands for Public Infrastructure Engineering Vulnerability Committee. And really it's a tool to help asset managers better understand and manage specific climate risks to their specific pieces of infrastructure. Um, some of the other key pieces of work include working with EPCOR where appropriate on their stormwater integrated resource plan, which is Edmonton's urban flood mitigation plan. And this of course is a key piece of climate adaptation work. We are developing a tool for adaptive management for implementation of specific actions in our action plan. And this is called flexible adaptation pathways. And this really is a tool to help us deal with that uncertainty um, that I talked about, about in decision-making around climate change. So you can see right now, we have really focused our efforts in the planning and development business areas of city decision-making. And part of that is because planning and development just plays a huge role in how well we are adapted to climate change. And part of that is because, you know, there were several large plans and standards that were being updated and that will lock us into, into infrastructure and development patterns into the future. And so we had to take advantage of the opportunity to integrate adaptation into those, into those plans and policies. Another big piece of work is around community connectedness and a lot of work to date in this bucket is around 
creating and publishing various resources for people. Uh, most of these, I believe, can be found on our website or linked to from our website with some that are still in the queue for launch and will be launched in upcoming months. Um, but really this work is intended to help people better understand climate change impacts and what that means for them and then help them, you know, prepare, for example, their homes for those impacts. And lastly, I want to mention that there are still some details around climate change and adaptation that we don't fully know or understand yet, or we need to understand at a scale that is more applicable to urban impacts. And we want to make sure that we are staying relevant to the best, best available scientific information. So there is still a good amount of work underway that I would say falls into the research area. So we are part of a regional adaptation collaborative, sorry, um, with surrounding municipalities in the region. And this project allowed us to do research on tree vulnerability, we did a pest vulnerability study, we did what I would call kind of a, a synthesis report on water security. We have a program set up from hosting the city's IPCC Climate Change and Cities Science Conference in 2018. And through that, we have a number of projects that different academic researchers are currently working on. And these research projects will help us to further develop programs based off of their findings. We worked with a climate scientist and statistician to develop a climate modeling app for us to use in-house that will have a lot of applicability to various pieces of our ongoing work. And we are working on some things upstream to City of Edmonton related to ecosystem valuation and water security. So those are the kind of just those big pieces of work that I wanted to share with you today. I know I have missed some, but as you can see, there is a lot of work underway to increase Edmonton's resilience to climate change. So that was adaptation. I do want to talk about the many climate change mitigation efforts that are also underway, as well as pointing to some of the resources that you can look at for things that you can do to act on climate change as well. So Edmonton has done a lot of work in, in implementing our energy transition strategy since that strategy first was approved in 2015. So I've listed a bunch of actions here on this slide. Um, you can see some things that have already been done, you know, include approving and funding the downtown district, district energy system, installing solar PV on some city facilities. Um, other facilities have been achieved BOMA best certification for sustainability. We're doing things like expanding our LRT and purchasing electric buses to help improve our transit fleet, installing, you know, a series of, inter of you know, our bike network, right, our, our, um, our cycle tracks are helping to advance active transportation in our city and all those types of things. So there's a lot of work that is underway in Edmonton um, around energy transition and climate change mitigation. As well, there's a lot of programs, resources, and tools for citizens to help you know, Edmontonians live sustainab sustainably. So on the changeforclimate.ca website, you can click on programs to find programs, tools, rebates for many different audiences. Um, if you want to be inspired by others, you know, you can click on stories and hear what other Edmontonians are doing around climate change. So really, I just wanted to point out that there are, you know, lots of actions that we are taking as a city and that we all can take to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. So that is actually it from me. Um, but just before I, you know, turn to questions, I just wanted to um, leave you with one more thought, and hopefully this actually works. <laughs> Let's go down this path for just a second. Let's go down this path because clean air feels better in your lungs than smog does. It's like no contest. Let's go down this path because rainforests and coral reefs and river valleys, these things aren't nice to haves, they're have to haves. Let's go down it because there are better ways to be remembered than a future full of hurricane and flood and famine. Let's go down this path because the path we were on forked a long time ago. Because the path we're on is the only one left. Let's go down this path together. See where it leads. So I think we're going to close things off here, but thank you again, uh, Danielle Koliak, for sharing your time and your expertise with us.